بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Let's get this radical, ignorant culture. Let's make sure our ladies, they are the mothers. If a woman lives by the Quran and the Sunnah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah has promised that if you do your duty to Allah and you be the righteous wife, you could enter any gate in paradise. Allahu Akbar. Don't only look for the gates down here. Look for the gates in paradise. Allahu, 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 Allah, Allah. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا اللهم رب يسر ولا تعسر وتمم بالخير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم صدق الله صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين أما بعد الحمد لله all praises and thanks are due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى for once more blessing us to be here today to perform the Salat al Jumar and to listen to the khutbah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his peace and blessings onto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'een and upon his family members and his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon each and every one of us to shower his hidayah, his guidance upon us, to shower his forgiveness upon us, and to shower his acceptance upon us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our a'mal fi sabilillah, insha'Allah. I once more seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon me by giving me the permission and the ability to fulfill this responsibility in delivering the khutbah, inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower unto me the quality of tawakkal Allah, the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the taqwa, the piety, the iman, the faith, the hikmah, the wisdom, the ilm, the knowledge, and the ability to fulfill this responsibility, inshallah. I once more put my tawakkal, I put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most uh, merciful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most sufficient. My brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, and bi Allah, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have been reminding ourselves over the past few weeks on the importance of living for 
the life hereafter, the pleasure of Allah. And if we live for the pleasure of Allah, and we live for the life hereafter, which has been commanded by Allah and demonstrated by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi Last week we reminded ourselves of a hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that if that's our concentration for the pleasure of Allah and the life hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa taala will take away the desire for this dunya. And that makes a lot of sense. If you live for the next life, you won't have the desire for this world. We will live this life as a means of necessity. But we will do and act for the hereafter, inshallah. And then we went down into some other hadith with the permission, permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind ourselves of some of the signs before the hour, the day of judgment, and one of those hadith we reminded ourselves, the synopsis of which is that after the battle of Uhud and after the Prophet Sallallahu when a few of the Sahabas and companions of the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, he reminded the Sahabas after that. that he has no fear that his ummah, his followers, will go back to idol worship or assign partners to Allah. But the fear that he has for us, this ummah, is that we will have envy amongst ourselves. And we will fight for worldly things. And That's what our Prophet Wasallam has said. And if we look around today, my brothers and sisters, that's what we see happening. A lot of times, and most of the times, and many a time, that's what we see. Unfortunately, while we got to put the blame on shaitan, that he's the one who is instilling that, it has a lot to do with our nafs, our ego. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu referred to us, his followers. Because if, our, if, we are, if we have the ikhlas and we have the sincerity for Allah, a couple of weeks ago we reminded ourselves on that topic that shaitan will not be able to have authority to mislead us. That's a promise Allah has made. The mukhlisin, the people who do things sincerely for Allah and only for Allah, shaitan will not be able to mislead us. So it's important, my brothers and sisters, that we understand that. And I don't want to get back into that topic. Uh, as I normally remind myself and I remind you, bi'ithnillah, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that um, you have the CDs from last week. You can get a copy of it. And over the past few weeks, where we reminded ourselves on this worldly life and living for the hereafter. Live. Enjoy life. Do what we have to do that is halal. Don't be in extravagance. Actually, last week we concentrated with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on living that balanced life. Live a good, happy, nice life. Mashallah. In Allah Jamilun wa Yahibbul Jamal. Allah is beautiful. He loves beautiful things. Allah has created this world so beautiful. And you look at the mountains and the stars, they're not just an ugly looking thing. The mountains are beautiful. The oceans are beautiful. It's a therapy for stress. It can relax you. Just the natural nature of the beauty that Allah has created. Allah loves beautiful things. The butterflies are so colorful. You look at the bird flying, it is so beautiful. Look at the bounties of Allah. You know, Allah has not just done things, He has done things beautifully for us. Because Allah loves beauty. 
And Allah wants us to be happy and to enjoy the beautiful things in this world. But he wants us to understand why for the pleasure of Allah. And we must not get off on the makhluk or the creation and get to love the creation so much because it's beautiful. Allah knows he has created this world very beautiful. But he wants us to remember that we worship and praise the khalik, the creator of this beautiful makhluk creation. Other than that, sometimes we get lost into the beautiful things in the world and we go off track. And that's how we get into that imbalance of only running down the creation, the makhluk, as opposed to worshipping the khalik, the creator. And that is what puts us into the, when we speak of worldly things, that's what the worldly things fall into. When things in this world, our intention, our misunderstanding, that can mislead us a great deal. And unfortunately, my brothers and sisters, that's the major problem today. And that's why, bi'idhnillah, we have been speaking on that over the past two or three weeks with the mercy and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today in the second khutbah, inshallah and bi with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to remind myself and you a little bit on living our life the way Allah expects us to live it. Living our life according to the Quran. And we have always reminded ourselves on topics of this nature, because this is important. You know, there is no more new revelations to come. There are no more prophets to come. So we got to remind ourselves of what Allah has commanded us with. And that's one of the major problems today in society, in the Muslim world. A lot of us read the Quran, but we really don't follow the message in the Quran. We really read it. And beautifully read it. The Prophet wasallam says one of the signs of the day of judgment is that people will read the Quran will be up to our throats. And that's as far as it will be. It will not be in our amal, in our actions, in our deeds, in our lifestyle. It will just be something that we say or we recite or we read. And that's the kind of environment we are seeing happening. 1.5 billion Muslims. Do you know if Muslims, the 1.5 billion Muslims, would really live Islam according to the Quran? My brothers and sisters, we will not be having this kind of negative thing against Muslims in the world. It can't. It won't. A politician will not be able to get up and say negative things about Muslims because one man by the name of Muhammad or Abdullah committed a crime. It will be known that he is just a man, a human being, who is a murderer or a killer and committed a crime. And no one will be able to blame all Muslims for that. But because we live in a closed shop and we don't demonstrate the real life of, a, of the Quran, the real life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi People have problems in understanding who is a Muslim. They don't know what we are and who we are. You know, we go to school, we go to colleges, you do businesses, and that's as far as it. You know, religion is taught in the universities, world religions. People learn it. They go back home. They isolate themselves. And especially us Muslims, we don't need to isolate ourselves. We have nothing to hide. Islam is an open book. The Quran is an open book. And actually the Quran is a book for everybody. So why do we hide it? Why do we hide the teachings of the Quran? And how do we hide the teachings of the Quran? By hiding ourselves. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was asked. Actually, has it Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her was asked about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Who or what is Muhammad? Tell us something about him. 
And in just a few words, she said, he is the living Quran. So if we, the Ummah, the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa would be the living Quran, you will not have people criticizing and condemning us. If you go back in some of the teachings and writings of Bernard Shaw, a very famous and well-known writer, British writer, when he was given the Quran and the Muslims told him to read it and he read it, one of his questions after reading the Quran, actually the people had told him, when you read the Quran, you must contact us after, based on some narrations. So they contacted him to ask him, what was your thought and what do you think about the Quran? Wonderful, beautiful, beautiful, superb. But his question was, I have a question. Who are the people who follow this book? Where are they? Who are the people who follow this book? Today we see a bunch of people that mostly follow a cultural religion. Today you can basically, and I say generally, we basically understand Muslims, not Islam, Muslims, by a culture. An Arab culture Muslim, a Pakistani culture Muslim, a Bengali culture Muslim, Indian culture Muslim, an Indonesian style Muslim, a Malaysian style. So we kind of know Muslims more by culture as opposed by the book. And that's a sad thing. And that is one of the reasons why we, we are being misrepresented today in the world. But if we would all leave, live according to this Quran, because Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, and I'm trying to get my evidence based on that, that he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was the living Quran. Which means as Muslims, we need to live by the book not by our culture, because that's very damaging. It kind of damages Islam. Remember this. Living our culture does not damage Islam. It kind of damages Islam. Allah has promised that he will protect this deen of Islam. It will damage us as it is damaging us in the world today. Then one guy does something wrong and all Muslims carry the blame because the world don't know who are Muslim. As Bernard Shaw asked, where are the people who follow this book? The world don't trust us, generally speaking. And, and my, my reason for that, my brothers and sisters, is yes, you go to school, you may have a Jewish teacher, you may have a Christian teacher, he teaches you biology or chemistry or history, Interesting. But do you trust him? You could trust him. But if you don't know him, you can't trust him. Yes, he's a teacher. But if you don't know him, you won't trust him. So similarly, a teacher can teach you in school. But if he doesn't know you, he can't trust you. It can happen to co-workers. You can be working together, doing business. But as far as business, you do business transactions. But do you know the people, their lifestyle, what they live for, what they stand for, their principles, their mannerism? No. And until we Muslims don't live that Islam, that Quran, you know the kufar, the infidels, the disbelievers in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They did not like the, to worship the oneness of God. It was against their practices and their teachings. So they opposed the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the basis of them worshipping idols and they did not like the idea that he was propagating something 
that is against their beliefs. Samaj gaya? But they knew who the man Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was. They knew who he was. They knew he was trustworthy. They knew he was loving. They knew his characteristics. They knew his tie. They knew his pattern. They knew what he stood for. That's why they gave him the title Al Amin, the trustworthy. That's why when he started preaching this concept of one God that they did not like, even though they did not like that, they told their uncle, Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet, they said, Tell your nephew. If he wants, we can give him the sun in his right hand. And we can give him the moon in his left hand. We will give him anything he wants. Power. Authority. Whatever he wants, we will give it to him. Because they knew him. They trusted him. They loved him. They just did not accept the teachings. You so much care about it. Today, our Islam is in the books. In the library, in the Quran, but the people don't know who Muslims are. A couple of weeks ago, I, I, I reminded myself when you nowadays Muslims don't even know Muslims. Nowadays, some of our Muslims don't even trust another Muslim. How are you going to trust another person? How do you expect a non Muslim to trust us when we don't even trust our own selves? You know, we don't even get involved in the Islamic society and community. So people could know us and trust us. We come to masjid, we pray Juma, we go back home in our gated community, and that's it. And we go to work, drop the kids to school, come back home, go to the grocery, boom, board a craft, go on vacation, come back. We're not even in the Muslim community. Do you know if someone asks me, do you know that brother? Could you recommend that brother? He comes to Darululu. Nine out of ten times I cannot because I don't know the brother. I'm telling you reality, Hakikat. Yeah, I know these few brothers I see here all the time. And the few brothers that pray all the time. Even the brothers who pray, I don't even know. I, I, I like to give you a living example. I really don't know. But until we don't get involved in community and social activities, even within the Muslim community, we can't even trust our own brothers. I'm not giving you an opinion. A couple, many, a couple of years ago, a super, uh, sergeant from the Pembroke Pines police called me. He said, Sheikh, I have someone from your mosque. Da, 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 da. He threatened to kill his wife. This is the evidence. And that, do you know him? I'm like, why? But I knew the brother. But all I knew of the brother is he comes and pray and I don't see him again. I didn't know that side of the brother. Because he's not involved in, in, he doesn't come to activities. He doesn't come to programs. He does not get involved in the, in the classes and the, the social activities we have. I see him pray. He goes home. He comes back. That's all. Does that mean I will know someone like that? I can't. I don't know his modus operandum as we would say in English. So if I hear and you hear and you can't verify for another brother who prays next to you and who prays five times a day, how you expect non-Muslims to say they know us? Huh? Come on, my brothers and sisters. Because we live a very selfish, social, worldly life. All it's about attaining the dunya. We pray because we have no choice. And we come. And we only, and it's just not everybody come for the five times Salah so you could know them. So they come once a week. You see a Muslim once a week. You don't see him involved when someone dies and someone has a problem and when you have a community social activity. You don't see them. So how are you going to know them? It, does, it, 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 it doesn't work, and I'm giving you my own example. As a situation with many situations, you know, many times you have problems in America, 
And the media goes to an imam, whether it's in Texas or California or New York, and says, do you know that brother? He said, you listen to the news, go Google it. He says, I see the brother coming to mosque, but I really don't know him, you know. You go check out what most of the imam says. I see the brother coming to mosque, yeah. But I don't really know him, so I can't verify for him if he's an ISIS or Al-Qaeda or a terrorist. So if an imam and a follower or a community member can't know each other, you expect non-Muslims to know us? So it's our problem. We are not living that Quran. And how do I connect that with Ibnillah? Because a few weeks ago, I reminded you and myself that the Prophet ﷺ was a community man. He founded an organization called Health Ul Fudul, where he used to go and do justice and social justice for the people in the community who had problems. And they would come to him. Non-Muslims. I'm not speaking about Muslims. Before he started preaching Islam, they will come to him. He will go to them in the community and try to help solve their problems. That's how the people knew him. So then we don't even come in our own Muslim community to solve problems. How do you expect the non-Muslims to know us? But until we don't do that, my brothers and sisters, we have a problem. You know, two days ago, and I need to say it now before I get in the second khutbah. I, 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 we had a lecture in um, Boyton Beach, Boyton Beach, right? myself and a rabbi, to a lot of Christians and, and Jews. Wednesday night, actually. And it was supposed to be a, a, a religion dialogue on religion. It ended up being about Muslims in America, because that's the topic all the time. You know? And one of the questions the lady asked, many, many, many questions they ask. You know, they ask a lot of questions. Um, one of the questions the lady asked is, are Muslim women really oppressed? What is this about Muslim women being oppressed? And I had to simply say, I said, Muslim women are not oppressed in Islam, according to the Quran and the Sunnah. I say, maybe in the East and Middle East and Far East Muslim countries, their culture oppress women. But the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no way in the teachings have any oppression to women. So people look at the oppression that women get in Muslim countries and affiliate it to the Quran. Listen, my brothers and sisters, let's take the masjid. In some of these places, they have made it, they have prohibited women from going to the masjid. Or they have set up the system in a way that women cannot go to the masjid. And if you look at the Quran, it addresses women. It didn't say salah is compulsory only for women. I mean for men. The virtues of salah are for women and men. The Prophet ﷺ has given a choice and a concession for women. For children and pregnancy and certain things that if they pray at home, they can get they will get the same blessings as though they go to the masjid. It was an exemption. It was not a matter of telling you you do not have to go to the masjid. It was a choice if you have other things to do and difficulties and inconveniences, etc. Then you can pray at home and you will get the same blessings. But never in the time of the Prophet ﷺ did he prohibit women from going to the masjid. So are you telling me the sheikhs and the mullahs and the, these people you have in these countries and people come to America here and want to implement that law? You look at the masjid right here. In other masjids, you may have on Jumu'ah day more women, but the regular salah is one or two, and if not, because we have that embedded in us that women don't have to go to masjid. They could go to the mall, they could shop, they could fly in a plane alone with a bunch of other men. They could do business, but they don't have to go to masjid. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala who tried to stop his wife from going to masjid in the night because of inconveniences and security reasons. She said, my prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa never stopped me from going to the masjid. You Umar cannot do that. She told Umar radiallahu ta'ala that, based on situation and security. 
Actually, the Prophet ﷺ has ordered and told the husbands, you cannot stop your woman from going to masjid. You go check some of her. I don't want to sound her Bengali and Pakistani and Indian and Caribbean Muslim mentality. Men tell her wives, you don't want to go to masjid. Eh? The wife said, I tell you I'm going to the mall. He can't stop her from going to the mall, but he stops her from going to the masjid. Because he has designed his own hadith and Quran. When the, go check it in Bukhari, the prophet said, he has prohibited men. He said, you cannot stop your wife from going to masjid. You see that? So our Muslim cultural men have oppressed our women from not being able to go to masjid. And then we bring that garbage here to America and try to implement that here. And then we claim we are Waliullah, long beard, subhanallah, big Muslim. Stupidity. It, it's sickening, my brothers and sisters. You know, I go around with non-Muslims and do a lot of lectures with Jews and Christians. And when they ask these questions, and I know it's all about culture that has misrepresented us, it's really sickening. It gets me angry sometimes, and I was be like, And I just went through this two nights ago. You know, about five or six men, seven people came to me. Man, well, because it was a big audience, so whoever got to come to me after they came and said, Sir, until today, and up until this moment today, I never liked Muslims and I never liked Islam. But I have just changed my mind and my concept after listening to the perspective of Islam that you have just explained. He said, that makes sense. So if we can't, if we could at least, you know, get people to better understand the Quran and the Sunnah and stop the hatred for Quran and Allah and Islam and, and Sunnah, we at least are doing something. And it has to be by living the Quran. And because we live a cultural life, we misrepresent this Quran, my brothers and sisters. We really, unfortunately, you know, and I need to share this again. I'm looking at the clock. I didn't even get on the second khutbah. Don't worry, we'll just wrap it up, inshallah. But, you know, it reminds me again, and I had to mention this to the people two nights ago there in Boynton Beach, very highly sophisticated area people. Eh? And they were like, um, and then I had to tell them again. I said, Sim look, take the example for driving a motor car. The, driving a car in, in Saudi Arabia is banned for women. I said, they asked me, is that an Islamic law? I said, no, that's a Saudi law. That's not a Quranic law. No way in the Quran says women are banned from driving. Actually, actually. In the days of the Prophet, وسلم, you go study it. And this, the khutbah is only a motivation, my brothers and sisters. Their motor cars were what? The camel, right? Excellent. The Maya motor cars were the camel. They had Mercedes style camel and Lexus style camel. You know what the Prophet وسلم, said? He said the best women to get married to are the women who ride, ride the camels. In the days of the Prophet, وسلم, women used to ride camels. That was their motor car. Yes, Saudi has given a law, they ban it, but that's not the prophet law. That's not the Quran law. And I, I will quote the hadith, the prophet said, Khaydu nisa raqibna raqibna al-ibl You know, ibl, ibli is the, the colloquial word for camels. He says, the best of the women, khaydu nisa are the women who ride camels. Marry those women. Because they're probably more athletic and more sportish. You want to marry a woman that she more dead than you? Or instead of she bring you alive, it's two dead people in the home. Come on. The prophet says, marry a woman who can have children, who can ride camels. We actually, our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his days, he allowed women to ride camels and he has commended them and said it's commendable to ride camels and also advised the men to marry those kind of women. Allahu Akbar. And you tell me Saudi has a law that women can't drive motor cars? That's the camels of today. Because even if you put camels on the roads in Mecca and Medina, they still won't let women ride camels today. 
but they will put a woman in a taxi with a strange man. She alone, no Perda, no Islam. What about that fake law? We don't live this Islam. In a taxi with a strange man all alone, taking her from here to there. That is Islam? Or oh, riding the camel. Let's think, thinkers, my brothers and sisters. Islam is for people who think. All right? In the next five, ten minutes, we'll conclude in the second khutbah, inshallah. So I just want to read two or three verses from the Quran to remind myself and you how and what Allah says about the importance of living our life according to the Quran, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannah without reckoning, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wan, alhamdulillah, rabbil Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, na'amaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natabakil wa alayhi. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Once more we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us to be here today to pray the Salat al-Jumar and to listen to the khutbah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his peace and blessings onto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his peace and blessings onto the family members of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and onto the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his mercy, his guidance, his forgiveness and his acceptance upon each and every one of us. And I once more ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon me by giving me the permission and the ability to continue with the second khutbah, inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show on to me the quality of tawakkal ala Allah, the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the taqwa, the piety, the iman, the faith, the hikmah, the wisdom, the ilm, the knowledge and the ability to continue with the second khutbah, inshallah. I put my tawakkal, I put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most su sufficient. My brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes I know some of you may agree and some of you may not agree or you may like or you may dislike, but you know, it doesn't matter whether you like or you dislike or you agree or you disagree. It's what is in Quran and Hadith we have no choice but to accept. And a lot of times you've got to accept whether you like it or you don't like it. That's very important to understand. Whether you like what is said or you don't like what is said, if it's in accordance with Quran and Sunnah, you have no choice but to accept it if you're Muslims. And if you're not a Muslim, well, you have the choice not to accept it. That's just how straight it is. So I know when we speak about a Hadith and the Prophet some saying about women, you know, simple as the paradigm for women in masjids. You know what was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? He encouraged the women to dress Islamic. And there was no parda that you have in the cultural masjid, masjids today. So much care. He was, that's the Islam we knew. So what our men of today came and did, they put up a wall. They put up a parda. You see, brothers, huh? the Caribbean Indo mentality thing. Huh? Indo. Put up a wall. Put up a big parda. Women could dress how they want. They could come in jeans and t-shirt. They could come half naked if they want. They could talk through the khutbah. They could do what they want during the khutbah. What a disgrace. Because we went against the sunnah. You go into many masjids. Alhamdulillah, we're a little better off here in Darululu. Because we have cameras all over so we could catch them if they talk. But <laughs> at the end of the day, what I'm saying is, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa man... Children and women. He encouraged the woman to pray the five times salah in the masjid. He encouraged the woman to come for Eid. He encouraged the woman to come for Juma. Today the husbands and men say, discourage them from coming. Which Islam are we following? The Quran that the Prophet lived? Or the 
Indian culture and Eastern, Far Eastern Caribbean culture. And I say Caribbean culture because Caribbean people, Guyanese and Trini, has inherited that indo pak cultural lifestyle also. So he encouraged the woman, dress properly, cover yourself properly. Come to masjid, sit and listen to the khutbah. Eid, Juma. On one occasion for Eid, after he delivered the khutbah to the man, he went and delivered another khutbah for the woman. That was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Today, what our culture does, brother Manju Sahib, we put the woman behind a wall, and they're talking all during the lectures. They're making noise. Some of them eating, some sleeping, babysitting. Where are you? Are you home? Is there a difference with the masjid and home? Because we bring our garbage culture to America also. I know some people would like it, you don't like it, but you don't have to like it and don't like it. You just accept what the professor some say. If you don't believe me, take the CD, go home, pull it up, and check it in Bukhari. Never was there a parada between them. That's a culture. All right? I don't want to talk about that again because I don't have the time. Let me just quote this verse from the Quran before time runs out, inshallah. In Surah at taqweed Chapter 81 of the Quran. To sort of concrete what we were saying, in the first khutbah in the last few minutes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, very beautiful, very well-known verses of the Quran. In huwa illa dhikrul lil alameen. In huwa illa dhikrul lil alameen. Referring to the Quran, that this Quran is a message, and if you go check the tafsir of this verse, it is a message for all the worlds. And worlds is beyond the world. It hasn't even reached our understanding. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Plural, worlds. So if we only take this world, we're talking about this message of the Quran is for Arabia, is for Pakistan, Bangladesh, America, Japan, China, Malaysia, wherever. This is the verse in the Quran. Here, what Allah says: This Quran, a message of the Quran is for everybody. So, if we don't, if we live this Quran with our own back home culture, how are we going to exemplify this message to the everybody? Huh? And people look at us as an Indian Muslim, a Pakistani Muslim, a Bengali Muslim, a Arab Muslim, a African Muslim, a Chinese Muslim, a Malaysian Muslim. And they're like, is that Islam? And everybody got their own laws. Every style of their kurta, their lungi, the length of their kurta. Everybody got their own Islam. Where is the Sunnah and the Quran? Huh? We have a problem. Is that what Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala has said? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi live in Quran. If we would live this Quran, then this message in huwa illa dhikru lil alameen of the Quran will be applicable wherever we go in the world. You understand, Brother Abdullah? You go in Alaska, the people there will understand it. You go in, in whatever little place and island, they will understand it if we live it according to Quran. But we have exemplified a cultural Islam. So they're scared of the Muslims, not Islam, not the Quran. It's us they're afraid of. Because we don't understand. Because we don't live this Quran. And if we live this Quran, everybody will understand. Even the animals will understand. Mm -hmm. All right. And here were the last two verses in the surah says. لِمَنْ شَاءَ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ يَسْتَقِيمُ The message, this Quran is for all mankind, for those who wills, who wants, whose intention, whose desire, whose decision is to be on the straight path. A lot of us today, it's not about the straight path. It's not about a straight path. It's about our culture. You know, I, 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 like, like the women sometimes, why some of these non-Muslim women don't understand women and they always think our women are oppressed? Because if they come to masjid, you don't see women. Only for Juma, a few of them. Other than that, where do you see Muslim women? In the mall. So you have an extreme Muslim or 
other type Muslim. Or you see them in weddings. And what do you see in a Muslim wedding, brothers? Ha ha <laughs> boy. Most expensive $100,000 jewelry. You see music, you see dance, you see all kind of craziness. Is that the woman? Of the Muslim woman? Have I? And then the people who organize the wedding don't even want a, a khutbah to remind the non-Muslims there and highlight what is Islam. So they leave a Muslim gathering to know that Muslims and women are all about flaunt the sari and the shalwal and the jewelry and the and dance, and wine, and music, and play, and fun. So that's the impression they have of the Muslim woman. Those are the free ones. The other ones, they dress Islamic. So we have confused the world. We totally confused them. Allah, because if we want to exemplify this Quran, Allah says this message is a message, and those people who want to live the right way, that's what this message is all about. It's not that you tell me it's culture to read Quran and teach your kids Quran when they're little kids. So you send them to the madrasa to learn Quran or live bata. When they start to read, you send them away to live kufa, the, 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 the haram life. Hmm? Have I? We push the Quran, read it in the maktab and madrasa. And when they get older, you say you live the dunya. That's what you're really supposed to be living, the dream. Haram. Don't worry, haram. And we know it's haram. But we say, what you going to do? That's the lifestyle today. Ajkal kazin dagi bai. Yehi hal hai ajkal. Come on, what ajkal are you talking about nowadays? Nothing has changed. The same Quran is here. The same hadith for 1400 years ago. The same Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the sahabas followed. The same Allah, the same law. What has changed? We have changed, you and I. The Islam is the same Islam in the books. So don't tell me what arch color nowadays is a different situation. Yes, we could live and enjoy it, but within the peripheral and the boundaries of the Quran and the Sunnah. And what does the last verse say? <laughs> Illa an yasha Allahu Rabbul Alameen. This Quran is a message, verse 27, for those who, for the whole world and all mankind, Christian, Jews, non-Muslims, everybody, we got to live it, exemplify it, teach it, practice it. And who does that? Those who really wants to be on the straight path. Not read it and implement a culture in their family life. And Allah says, but ye shall not will. He said, don't worry. You cannot will what you want. We got to will what Allah wants. Allahu Akbar. That's really the tafsir of this ayah. We should not will our culture. And I know we have a variety of cultures here. Nigeria. Ghana, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Caribbean, all those other people here. Syria, all over we have here. You can't want to live Islam, your culture. And our culture. Allah says you got to live. And yasha Allah, by the will of Allah. Which is the message of the Quran. Which is for the whole world. That's the Islam we got to live. And you go and set up, you go check out. And I really got to conclude now. Most of the masajid, that's a disease. Sorry to say that, but as I mean, you anyway. <laughs> you go and look at a disease we have with culture in America. Powerful, democratic country with Muslims who come here to live the, a different life and should be a better Muslim as opposed to culture, but we bring it here. You know, there is a saying, you could take a man out of the gutter, but you can't take the gutter out of him. You understand? Urdu mein kya kehenge? Ek aadmi, dihat se nikal sakte. You can take a man out of the village, but you cannot take the village mentality out of him. Was my Urdu correct? I don't know. At least you understand it, right? Okay, don't worry about the sophisticated thing. We can't take the dihati from him. That's why a lot of us, when we reach, we park, we drive our cars and park our cars and run our businesses according to doctors and professors and lawyers and businessmen. And we take the shoes off, and we come in the masjid, we operate like dihatis. Villages, mentality, 
that is not professionally Islam. We don't care. That's, I see that all over the place. But I don't blame the people. That's how even the massages run. You go throughout America, the majority of massages, you know what happens? Brother Abdul Salam, you go to a lot of Jamaat. Tell me what you ex experience. You get the most educated, the highest graduate, top scholar and imam to be the imam of the masjid. But the masjid board is run by a bunch of cultural people. And the imam has no choice but to play the tune of the culture of those who pay him, who run the board. Go around, man. You don't need to go in Georgia and New York to go and see what I... I travel all around the world, country and the world. I know what I'm telling you. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Well, speak of my experience. Is a majority of the people on the board is a cultural board. If they're Arab, the Imam got to preach Arab Islam. If they're Pakistani, got to preach Pakistani Islam. If they're Bengali, got to preach Bengali Islam. If they're Caribbean, got to preach Caribbean Islam. African Islam. What are we talking about? What is going on? And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived Quran? Did he live an Arab style? Did he propagate? When Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and how was asked, who or what is Muhammad? Did he say he's a good Arab? He lives the perfect Arab life? Or the Arab dream? He lived the Quran. So you pay the biggest shake from the Al-Hazhar and all the world all over. That's why the Prophet says one of the signs of the Day of Judgment, the Quran will only be up to our throat, not in our actions and our amal. I reminded myself and you on that in the first khutbah. Those of you who came late, take the CD after Juma, inshallah. You pay the biggest scholar, and I'm telling you what scholars call me and tell me. But the board that runs it, the board that pays him, plays the game. And he got to teach them Islam according to that culture. You go check it out. Illa mashallah, except a few places. That's why the community will be like that. And that's why the non-Muslims will not know who is Islam. And they have no problem with Islam and Quran and Allah, but the Muslims. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. Now I came early today, started exact quarter two because I really hoped I would have finished at 2.30, but shh. You know, when you get into the topic, it just rolls. But I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Alhamdulillah, ya Allah, ya Rahim, Rahim, ya Kafur, Rahim. Oh Allah, we thank thee for all the favors and bounties you have bestowed upon us, ya Allah. We ask thee, Allah, to send your peace and blessings unto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask thee, Allah, to guide us and protect us, ya Allah. And give us that hidayah to live by the Quran and to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And forgive us for our shortcomings, ya Allah. اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وفي الآخرة إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آل محمد بعدد من صلى وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آل محمد بعدد من قعد وقام وصل على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى كل ملائكتك المقربين وعلى إباد الله الصالحين برحمتك يا رحم الرحمين إباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبال يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله تعالى أعلى وأولى وعز وجل الله أكبر الله أكبر بمسلم